This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, August 2, 1907. Chapters from my Autobiography, Chapter 21, by Mark Twain. From Susie's Biography of Me, February 12, 1886. Mama and I have both been very troubled of late, because Papa, since he had been publishing General Grant's book, has seemed to forget his own books and work entirely, and the other evening, as Papa and I were promenading up and down the library, he told me that he didn't expect to write but one more book, and then he was ready to give up work altogether, die, or do anything. He said that he had written more than he had ever expected to, and the only book that he had been particularly anxious to write was one locked up in the safe downstairs, not yet published. Note, it isn't yet. Title of it, Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven. S.L.C. But this intended future, of course, will never do, and although Papa usually holds to his own opinions and intents with outsiders, when Mama really desires anything and says that it must be, Papa always gives up his plans, at least so far, and does as she says is right, and she is usually right, if she disagrees with him at all. It was because he knew his great tendency to being convinced by her that he published without her knowledge that article in the Christian Union concerning the government of children. So judging by the proofs of past years, I think that we will be able to persuade Papa to go back to work as before, and not leave off writing with the end of his next story. Mama says that she sometimes feels, and I do too, that she would rather have Papa depend on his writing for a living than to have him think of giving it up. Dictated November 8, 1906. I have a defect of a sort which I think is not common. Certainly I hope it isn't. It is rare that I can call before my mind's eye the form and face of either friend or enemy. If I should make a list, now, of persons whom I know in America and abroad, say, to the number of even an entire thousand, it is quite unlikely that I could reproduce five of them in my mind's eye of my dearest and most intimate friends, I could name eight of whom I have seen and talked with four days ago, but when I try to call them before me, they are formless shadows. Jean has been absent this past eight or ten days in the country, and I wish I could reproduce her in the mirror of my mind, but I can't do it. It may be that this defect is not constitutional, but a result of lifelong absence of mind and indolent and inadequate observation. Once or twice in my life it has been an embarrassment to me. Twenty years ago, in the days of Susie's biography of me, there was a dispute one morning at the breakfast-table about the color of a neighbor's eyes. I was asked for a verdict, but had to confess that if that valued neighbor and old friend had eyes, I was not sure that I had ever seen them. It was then mockingly suggested that perhaps I didn't even know the color of the eyes of my own family, and I was required to shut my own at once and testify. I was able to name the color of Mrs. Clemens' eyes, but was not able to even suggest a color for Jean's or Clara's or Susie's. All this talk is suggested by Susie's remark. The other evening, as Papa and I were promenading up and down the library, down to the bottom of my heart I am thankful that I can see that picture, and it is not dim, but stands out clear in the unfaded light of twenty-one years ago. In those days Susie and I used to promenade daily up and down the library, with our arms about each other's waists, and deal in intimate communion concerning affairs of state, or the deep questions of human life, or our small personal affairs. It was quite natural that I should think I had written myself out when I was only fifty years old, for everybody who has ever written has been smitten with that superstition at about that age. Not even yet have I really written myself out. I have merely stopped writing because dictating is pleasanter work, and because dictating has given me a strong aversion to the pen, and because two hours of talking per day is enough, and because— but I am only damaging my mind with this digging around in it for pretexts where no pretext is needed, and where the simple truth is for this one time better than any invention in this small emergency. I shall never finish my five or six unfinished books, 
for the reason that by forty years of slavery to the pen I have earned my freedom. I detest the pen, and I wouldn't use it again to sign the death warrant of my dearest enemy. Dictated March 8, 1906 For thirty years I have received an average of a dozen letters a year from strangers who remember me, or whose fathers remember me as boy and young man. But these letters are almost always disappointing. I have not known these strangers, nor their fathers. I have not heard of the names they mention. The reminiscences to which they call attention have had no part in my experience, all of which means that these strangers have been mistaking me for somebody else. But at last I have the refreshment, this morning, of a letter from a man who deals in names that were familiar to me in my boyhood. The writer encloses a newspaper clipping which has been wandering through the press for four or five weeks, and he wants to know if Captain Tongray, lately deceased, was, as stated in the clipping, the original of Huckleberry Finn. I have replied that Huckleberry Finn was Frank F. As this inquirer evidently knew the Hannibal of the forties, he will easily recall Frank. Frank's father was at one time town drunkard, an exceedingly well-defined and unofficial office of those days. He succeeded General Gaines, and for a time he was sole and only incumbent of the office, but afterward Jimmy Finn proved competency, and disputed the place with him. So we had two town drunkards at one time, and it made as much trouble in that village as Christendom experienced in the fourteenth century, when there were two popes at the same time. In Huckleberry Finn I have drawn Frank exactly as he was. He was ignorant, unwashed, insufficiently fed, but he had as good a heart as ever any boy had. His liberties were totally unrestricted. He was the only really independent person, boy or man, in the community, and by consequence he was tranquilly and continuously happy, and was envied by all the rest of us. We liked him. We enjoyed his society. And as his society was forbidden us by our parents, the prohibition trebled and quadrupled its value, and therefore we sought and got more of his society than of any other boys. I heard four years ago that he was justice of the peace in a remote village in the state of blank, and was a good citizen, and was greatly respected. During Jimmy Finn's term he, Jimmy, was not exclusive, he was not finical, he was not hypercritical, he was largely and handsomely democratic, and slept in the deserted tan-yard with the hogs. My father tried to reform him once, but did not succeed. My father was not a professional reformer. In him the spirit of reform was spasmodic. It only broke out now and then, with considerable intervals between. Once he tried to reform Injun Joe. That also was a failure. It was a failure, and we boys were glad. For Injun Joe, drunk, was interesting and a benefaction to us. But Injun Joe, sober, was a dreary spectacle. We watched my father's experiments upon him with a good deal of anxiety, but it came out all right, and we were satisfied. Injun Joe got drunk oftener than before, and became intolerably interesting. I think that in Tom Sawyer I starved Injun Joe to death in the cave, but that may have been to meet the exigencies of romantic literature. I can't remember now whether the real Injun Joe died in the cave or out of it, but I do remember that the news of his death reached me at a most unhappy time that is to say, just at bedtime, on a summer night, when a prodigious storm of thunder and lightning, accompanied by a deluging rain that turned the streets and lanes into rivers, caused me to repent and resolve to lead a better life. I can remember those awful thunderbursts and the white glare of the lightning yet, and the wild lashing of the rain against the window-panes. By my teachings I perfectly well knew what all that wild riot was for. Satan had come to get Injun Joe. I had no shadow of doubt about it. It was the proper thing when a person like Injun Joe was required in the underworld, and I should have thought it strange and unaccountable if Satan had come for him in a less impressive way. With every glare of lightning I shriveled and shrunk together in mortal terror, and in the interval of black darkness that followed I poured out my lamentings over my lost condition, and my supplications for just one more chance, with an energy and feeling and sincerity quite foreign to my nature. But in the morning I saw that it was a false alarm, and concluded to resume business at the old stand and wait for another reminder. The axiom says, History repeats itself. A week or two ago Mr. Blank Blank dined with us, 
At dinner he mentioned a circumstance which flashed me back over about sixty years and landed me in that little bedroom on that tempestuous night, and brought to my mind how creditable to me was my conduct through the whole night, and how barren it was of moral spot or fleck during that entire period. He said Mr. X was sexton or something of the Episcopal Church in his town, and had been for many years the competent superintendent of all the Church's worldly affairs, and was regarded by the whole congregation as a stay, a blessing, a priceless treasure. But he had a couple of defects, not large defects, but they seemed large when flung against the background of his profoundly religious character. He drank a good deal, and he could outswear a brakeman. A movement arose to persuade him to lay aside these vices, and after consulting with his pal, who occupied the same position as himself in the other Episcopal Church, and whose defects were duplicates of his own, and had inspired regret in the congregation he was serving, they concluded to try for reform, not wholesale, but half at a time. They took the liquor pledge, and waited for results. During nine days the results were entirely satisfactory, and they were recipients of many compliments and much congratulation. Then, on New Year's Eve, they had business a mile and a half out of town, just beyond the state line. Everything went well with them that evening in the bar-room of the inn, but at last the celebration of the occasion by those villagers came to be of a burdensome nature. It was a bitter cold night, and the multitudinous hot toddies that were circulating began by and by to exert a powerful influence upon the new prohibitionists. At last X's friend remarked, X, does it occur to you that we are outside the diocese? That ended reform number one. Then they took a chance in reform number two. For a while that one prospered, and they got much applause. I now reach the incident which sent me back a matter of sixty years, as I have remarked a while ago. One morning Mr. Blank Blank met X on the street, and said, "'You have made a gallant struggle against those defects of yours. I am aware that you failed on number one, but I am also aware that you are having better luck with number two. "'Yes,' X said, "'number two is all right and sound up to date, and we are full of hope.' Blank Blank said, X, of course you have troubles, like other people, but they never show on the outside. I have never seen you when you are not cheerful. Are you always cheerful? Really always cheerful? Well, no, he said. No, I can't say that I am always cheerful. But, well, you know that kind of a night that comes. Say, you wake up way in the night, and the whole world is sunk in gloom, and there are storms and earthquakes and all sorts of disasters in the air threatening, and you get cold and clammy. And when that happens to me, I recognize how sinful I am, and it all goes clear to my heart, and rings it, and I have such terrors and terrors. Oh, they are indescribable, those terrors that assail me and I slip out of bed and get on my knees and pray and pray and promise that I will be good if I can only have another chance. And then, you know, in the morning the sun shines out so lovely, and the birds sing, and the whole world is so beautiful, and, God, I rally! Now I will quote a brief paragraph from this letter which I have a minute ago spoken of. The writer says, You no doubt are at a loss to know who I am. I will tell you. In my younger days, I was a resident of Hannibal, Missouri, and you and I were schoolmates, attending Mr. Dawson's school, along with Sam, and Will Bowen, and Andy Fuqua, and others whose names I have forgotten. I was then about the smallest boy in school for my age, and they called me Little Alec for short. I only dimly remember him, but I knew those other people as well as I knew the town drunkards. I remember Dawson's schoolhouse perfectly. If I wanted to describe it, I could save myself the trouble by conveying the description of it to these pages from Tom Sawyer. I can remember the drowsy and inviting summer sounds that used to float in through the open windows from that distant boy paradise, Cardiff Hill, Holiday's Hill, and mingle with the murmurs of the studying pupils, and make them the more dreary by the contrast. I remember Andy Fuqua, the oldest pupil, a man of twenty-five. I remember the youngest pupil, Nanny Owsley, a child of seven. I remember George Robards, eighteen or twenty years old, the only pupil who studied Latin. I remember in some cases vividly, in others vaguely, the rest of the twenty-five boys and girls. I remember Mr. Dawson very well. I remember his boy, Theodore, who was as good as he could be. In fact, he was inordinately good, extravagantly good, offensively good, detestably good. 
and he had Popeyes, and I would have drowned him if I had had a chance. In that school we were all about on an equality, and, so far as I remember, the passion of envy had no place in our hearts except in the case of Arch Fuqua, the other one's brother. Of course we all went barefoot in the summertime. Arch Fuqua was about my own age, ten or eleven. In the winter we could stand him, because he wore shoes then, and his great gift was hidden from our sight, and we were enabled to forget it. But in the summertime he was a bitterness to us. He was our envy, for he could double back his big toe and let it fly, and you could hear a snap thirty yards. There was not another boy in the school that could approach this feat. He had not a rival as regards a physical distinction, except in Theodore Eddy, who could work his ears like a horse. But he was no real rival, because you couldn't hear him work his ears, so all the advantage lay with Arch Fuqua. I am not done with Dawson's school. I will return to it in a later chapter. Dictated at Hamilton, Bermuda, January 6, 1907. That reminds me. In conversation we are always using that phrase, and seldom or never noticing how large a significance it bears. It stands for a curious and interesting fact, to wit, that sleeping or waking, dreaming or talking, the thoughts which swarm through our heads are almost constantly, almost continuously, accompanied by a like swarm of reminders of incidents and episodes of our past. A man can never know what a large traffic this commerce of association carries on in our minds until he sets out to write his autobiography. He then finds that a thought is seldom born to him that does not immediately remind him of some event, large or small, in his past experience. Quite naturally these remarks remind me of various things, among others this, that sometimes a thought, by the power of association, will bring back to your mind a lost word or a lost name which you have not been able to recover by any other process known to your mental equipment. Yesterday we had an instance of this. Rev. Joseph H. Twitchell is with me on this flying trip to Bermuda. He was with me on my last visit to Bermuda, and today we are trying to remember when it was. We thought it was somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty years ago, but that was as near as we could get at the date. Twitchell said that the landlady in whose boarding-house we sojourned in that ancient time could doubtly furnish us the date, and we must look her up. We wanted to see her anyway, because she and her blooming daughter of eighteen were the only persons whose acquaintance we had made at that time, for we were travelling under fictitious names, and people who wear aliases are not given to seeking society and bringing themselves under suspicion. But at this point in our talk we encountered an obstruction. We could not recall the landlady's name. We hunted all around through our minds for that name, using all the customary methods of research, but without success. The name was gone from us, apparently permanently. We finally gave the matter up, and fell to talking about something else. The talk wandered from one subject to another, and finally arrived at Twitchell's school days in Hartford, the Hartford of something more than half a century ago, and he mentioned several of his schoolmasters dwelling with special interest upon the peculiarities of an aged one named Olney. He remarked that Olney, humble village schoolmaster as he was, was yet a man of superior parts, and had published textbooks which had enjoyed a wide currency in America in their day. I said I remembered those books, and had studied Olney's geography in school when I was a boy. Then Twitchell said, That reminds me. Our landlady's name was a name that was associated with school books of some kind or other fifty or sixty years ago. I wonder what it was. I believe it began with a K. Association did the rest, and did it instantly. I said, Kirkham's Grammar. That settled it. Kirkham was the name, and we went out to seek for the owner of it. There was no trouble about that, for Bermuda is not large, and is like the earlier Garden of Eden in that everybody in it knows everybody else, just as it was in the Serpent's headquarters in Adam's time. We easily found Miss Kirkham, she that had been the blooming girl of a generation before, and she was still keeping boarders, but her mother had passed from this life. She settled the date for us, and did it with certainty, by help of a couple of uncommon circumstances, events of that ancient time. She said we had sailed from Bermuda on the 24th of May, 1877, which was the day on which her only nephew was born, and he is now thirty years of age. The other unusual circumstance, she called it an unusual circumstance, and I didn't say anything, was that on that day the Reverend Mr. Twitchell, bearing the assumed name of Peters, 
had made a statement to her which she regarded as a fiction. I remembered the circumstance very well. We had bidden the young girl good-bye, and had gone fifty yards, perhaps, when Twitchell said he had forgotten something. I doubted it, and must go back. When he rejoined me he was silent, and this alarmed me, because I had not seen an example of it before. He seemed quite uncomfortable, and I asked him what the trouble was. He said he had been inspired to give the girl a pleasant surprise, and so had gone back, and said to her, "'That young fellow's name is not Wilkinson. That's Mark Twain.' She did not lose her mind, she did not exhibit any excitement at all, but said quite simply, quite tranquilly, "'Tell it to the Marines, Mr. Peters, if that should happen to be your name.' It was very pleasant to meet her again. We were white-headed, but she was not. In the sweet and unvexed spiritual atmosphere of the Bermudas one does not achieve gray hairs at forty-eight. I had a dream last night, and of course it was born of association like nearly everything else that drifts into a person's head asleep or awake. On board ship, on the passage down, Twitchell was talking about the swiftly developing possibilities of serial navigation, and he quoted those striking verses of Tennyson's which forecast a future when airborne vessels of war shall meet and fight above the clouds, and redden the earth below with a rain of blood. This picture of carnage and blood and death reminded me of something which I had read a fortnight ago, statistics of railway accidents compiled by the United States government, wherein the appalling fact was set forth that on our two hundred thousand miles of railway we annually kill ten thousand persons outright and injure eighty thousand. The warships in the air suggested the railway horrors, and three nights afterwards the railway horrors suggested my dream. The work of association was going on in my head unconsciously all that time. It was an admirable dream, what there was of it. In it I saw a funeral procession. I saw it from a mountain peak. I saw it crawling along and curving here and there, serpent-like, through a level, vast plain. I seemed to see a hundred miles of the procession, but neither the beginning of it nor the end of it was within the limits of my vision. The procession was in ten divisions, each division marked by a sombre flag, and the whole represented ten years of our railway activities in the accident time. Each division was composed of eighty thousand cripples, and was bearing its own years, ten thousand mutilated corpses, to the grave. In the aggregate eight hundred thousand cripples and one hundred thousand dead, drenched in blood. Mark Twain. To be Continued.